since I'm paying through the notes for the microphone, I'll ask the first uh, question. And I don't know, I guess for either, but maybe Michelle, you first. The president has, uh, for all the talk about how he's, uh, you know, a notorious nativist, restrictionist, et cetera, even during the campaign, but most notably more recently, he's talked about increasing immigration. And um, I was just wondering if you had any thoughts on sort of where that's coming from and what kind of, uh, you know, political consequences it might have. I have no freaking clue, <laughs> Mark. <laughs> um, yeah, the, the line that really stuck in my craw during the State of the Union was it just seemed to come out of literally left field or Jared Ivanka's mouths into his ear <laughs> whispered before he gave the speech about, what was it, that he wanted to have the, the highest, highest amount of, or yeah, level levels ever of, or of, of, of immigration. And um, I don't know. The, the, the conventional wisdom is that whoever's the last to talk to him is, is how his policy statements are, are, are crafted. And this is another reason why we need Jason's and Mark's and John Miano's <laughs> penetrating the inner sanctum of the uh, uh, of the White House, or at least getting on the main stage at at, at CPAC. Um, uh, you know, even while we were writing um, sold out, um, you know, there was there was a lot of ideological whiplash, at least on on illegal immigration and border security. He hasn't wavered, even though as as we've we, we've tried to to uh, try to impress upon him that the, the wall is just half the battle. Um, but he does seem to have, which I appreciate, given the given the past occupiers of the office, at least some instinctive or emotional connection to American families that have uh, been harmed. You know, from the from the public safety and, and national security aspect um, of unfettered immigration. If only he would bring back the H-1B replaced American tech workers that also campaigned with him uh, and bring them back to the White House the same way that the angel moms have a, a, a place at the table. Yeah, you know, Mark, if you have some I, thoughts, it, sure. It, it seems... You know, from my perspective, you know, I'm, I'm somewhat ensconced in the Washington, D.C. bubble as well, uh, that high skill immigration sounds like something that would poll well. Oh, yeah, high skills. Well, we want skills, don't we? And, you know, it really doesn't. And when you look at the polling, people are not generally enthusiastic about it. And, you know, as Michelle said, President Trump is generally pretty well tapped in, at least instinct instinctually. I mean, he's not exactly a, a top political operator, but I think he has good instincts about what the average Joe is thinking. In this case, he's he's really very off because the, the polls just don't bear out what people inside this bubble seem to think about. Any uh, questions? Yeah. You know, um, is this on? Yeah. Okay. I was just going to say one possible explanation for some of your findings about you know, the low scores, and then when you try to control for length in the United States, it doesn't make any difference. The average immigrant in America has lived here for 20 years. The average college graduate, it's something like 18 years. What you're essentially getting is the test scores of someone who's lived here for 18 years on average. And so that's why when you control for length of residence, you're not really getting anything. It's because they're not new arrivals. The low scores... Immigrant high poverty or welfare use or struggling in English do not reflect the fact that a lot of immigrants are recent. So lots are. Mm -hmm. But there's so many more who aren't recent that that's really what I think your, your data reflects. There's a kind of a sense that, well, aren't they all new arrivals? You know, that's not the case. We, we know because the American Community Survey asks individual year of arrival, and we have this enormous sample of hundreds of thousands of immigrants. So we actually know how long people have been here. And, Still, with those high average lengths of time, a lot of folks really do struggle. I, I would say that people with foreign degrees probably have been here for a shorter time than people who have U.S. degrees. But nevertheless, I, I certainly take your point that it, most of these people have been here quite a long time. And, you know, when you, when you remove the people who have been here within five years, you know, you haven't really changed your sample that much. And that, that's your point. Any other questions? Um, I actually had another question. Um, uh, it's sort of more an observation, I guess. I mean, I spent two years in a uh, at a university in a developing country, a 
then Soviet ruled Armenia, and all kinds of people just bribed their way into college and bribed their way to pass classes and bribed their way to get a diploma. And in fact, it wasn't even a bribe. It was almost like an unofficial requirement that you had to pay in order to be able to, you also had to pay to get your kid out of the uh, nursery after you gave birth. I mean, this is the way a lot of places <laughs> work. And so, um, so in a, in a sense, I mean, it is interesting to look at what it is that's driving it because um, people from the same places with U.S. diplomas don't have the same issue. So it's not even a, um, in other words, it's, it's not so much a nation of origin issue as it is the way the educational institutions themselves essentially function and screen people. At least that's my guess. I mean, your data doesn't specifically identify that. But Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's probably right. I, I mean, when, when I was looking at the, uh, the immigrants in low-skill jobs versus high-skill jobs, I remember thinking that, you know, one explanation might be, you know, for this diversity of, of success in the United States is just unfamiliarity with the, with the culture. Uh, but uh, now we sort of have the test score data, and I, I do think it is a, a real skill difference it's reflecting. Uh, yes, in the back, and then you, sir. Yeah. Hi, have you done any research in um, universities looking at uh, the STEM majors, which we've all been told as parents that that's where your kids need to be, and um, you know where that sits with all of this um, discussion on the high school labor? I did an interview with the dean of STEM at UC San Diego a couple of years ago, and he said that their graduates in STEM have a lower, you know, they go out and they're, they're, they have a lower uh, percentage of getting a job in their field, A, and B, they're losing these jobs to H-1B-1 visas because they'll work for a lot cheaper than the kids who have a, you know, U.S. paid for college education. Have you done anything on that front? Because I think that parents would react to something like that. Yeah, CIS has done a, a considerable amount of work on that, and I think the the general finding has been that, you know, this idea of a, a labor shortage in STEM just is not borne out by the data. If you look at employment trends or unemployment rates in that area, uh, you you don't see this, you know, strange dearth of uh, of available STEM graduates. In fact, you find lots of STEM graduates who are not working uh, in STEM fields. So I, I I do think that that is is, is a bit overblown. Yeah, it's, it's, it's all. Okay. It, it's, it's all explained and, and sold out. Yeah. I, mean, from the, <laughs> I think it's from, still on Amazon. Yes, yeah, <laughs> I mean, from, from the manufacturing of the, the fake uh, STEM worker shortage um, crisis to begin with, the way that uh, these national scientific uh, foundation types um, cooked up that up in the first place. Um, and then, of course, you know, the, the talking out of both sides of their mouths of, of most of Silicon Valley. Um, I mean, it's all related. Here you have this, this uh, scare and hysteria from Silicon Valley that there aren't enough uh, skilled American um, students, that there's something wrong with our education system, and that's what, of course, led to the adoption of something like Common Core. Um, when it's the same Silicon Valley companies that are arguing for busting the H-1B caps and, and stabbing uh, STEM graduates in, in, in the back. Can you just, like, add one little point here on this as well? Yeah. It's, you know, they're taking kids. They're all going to the same university. So yeah. you're saying that native-borns are, I'm not saying this, but this is what the, you know, the elites are saying, that native-borns are just dumber than people that come here from other countries. And no, that's, I'm in essence, what they're saying. That's what they're yeah. saying. That's yeah, contrary exactly. to the data. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So they, well, when, I mean... But, but nobody's reporting about that stuff. <laughs> 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 and, sir, you had a question back there in the... Yeah. yeah. There's the mic. Thank you. Yeah, uh, in response to that last question, one thing that a lot of people don't know with the concentration in, of the discussion on the H-1B is that there are many other visas, one of them being the OPT. Yes. The OPT visa has gone in the last 10 years from roughly 30,000 um, students, which is the graduates of uh, a medium-sized university, to more than 300,000 uh, foreign students getting STEM jobs in the last year. So 30,000 to 300,000. So if your child is in college in a STEM program, 
um, it's very likely that they will not get that technology job, which will go to a uh, foreign student. And one reason is that the State Department gives a 10% reduction in taxes. They, they get a tax reduction. They don't have to pay certain taxes for those graduates, for those uh, employees. It's little wonder that uh, they uh, preferentially hire foreign students over U.S. students. Um, one other comment. Um, okay, so just, just you know, to clarify that, these are people with U.S. degrees right. who are nonetheless given these essentially subsidized positions. So, so I mean, this is in a sense almost the somewhat better part of the college graduate immigrant college graduate population, but it's still used to undermine uh, the opportunities for American uh, young people. That, that visa from 12 months, where it was originally authorized. Uh, under George Bush, it was extended to 26 months. And then under Obama, it was extended to 39 months. Both of those extensions being done by presidential fiat, not by statutory authority by and, Congress. And being challenged by, by John in court, where they have been um, met with obstacles every step of the way in trying to get standing for American workers. You would think so. that if parents knew about this, they would be shocked. But one of the do you have um, a, do you have a question to so those other people? If you could, thank you. I will yeah, cede the microphone to the next person. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, here uh, up here. Yeah, Jim had a question. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, Jim McDonald's my name, but a, a real small story. But I, when I was working for USDA Forest Service some years ago, I was for a while. I did the space management preparation of offices for people coming in. So we had con there was a contractor group, and I was to rearrange this office because there were going to be more people brought in. Well, as it turned out, I knew some of the people that worked there already. They were Americans. The guys being brought in were all Indians. I knew that because I talked to them as I was taking care of this office arrangements. And the deal was that the Americans, one of them did quit, they were going to be required to take a 20% pay cut. If they wanted to keep working, they had to take a 20% pay cut. And then they brought in these Indian guys, and so it was just right in my face. But so my impression in listening to some of this is that basically STEM is maybe perhaps, or at least within the computer realm, these guys that I was talking about were doing computer technology stuff, uh, is maybe somewhat overrated as to what it takes to really be competitive in the field. Otherwise, you know, they're bringing in kind of these wasp roles, and yet somehow I guess it works out. You hire enough of them, and somehow you still <laughs> get the stuff done. And so, is, so, so is there some something to my proffer that perhaps there just isn't as much required to be a STEM person in practice as it there might thought to be. Anyway, thank you. The uh, and just to. Um, uh, the earlier comment um, to refer to it optional practical training as an entire chapter yes. in uh, in Michelle's the book she co-authored L visas one foreign student visa EB five in other words there's a whole variety of these um, programs uh, that as the book subtitle says Beltway crap weasels are using to screw American workers um, and the we've written actually a good deal on this opt optional practical training program where foreign students aren't students anymore, but they're students in air quotes. It's just one of the elements of immigration law across all different aspects, which is really based on lies. I mean, there's, it's, it's Orwellian, the language in immigration law, and optional practical training is one of them, where you're no longer a student, but you're technically, you're sort of a student, and you're not training, you're working for three years for low wages and subsidized because you don't have to pay payroll taxes, Social Security and Medicare taxes. Was there, yes, sir? I can speak to your point uh, quickly. A lot of the stuff that these guys are doing is really just, they're gluing websites together with Python code. They're rearranging pages on Facebook. I mean, none of this is, is uh, you know, a cutting edge AI stuff. So in America, it's good. Oh, absolutely. It absolutely. is not O visa. Yeah. <laughs> You're right, 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 it's not the. Uh, and, and yeah. you know, John points out too that, you know, on the one hand, you have this rhetoric that the H-1B uh, visa holders are the quote-unquote best and the brightest, but you have this skill-based uh, prevailing wage system where once they have to define what the actual skill level is, most of them end up falling into the lowest skill level, and then nearly all of them are at least 
um, at the lowest two skill level. So, you know, that says everything you need to say. Yeah, sure, quick. Um, I provide software support for um, computer language for companies worldwide, and we see more and more of their employees being, being Indians. None of them are really outstanding. Some of them are, are just terrible. I spent the last two weeks working with a company in Cleveland and talked to the director yesterday and kind of gently told him he was wasting his money. These guys knew nothing. I mean, really nothing. It's kind of like me being an HVAC tech for $5 an hour. Yeah, I'm cheap, but I'm no good. The uh, interesting thing, I think, is the political dynamic here. You kind of referred to it a little bit, Jason, is that, you know, I mean, it's changing a little now because you're getting some younger congressmen, but frankly, a lot of these congressmen don't even know how to turn their own computer on. So when some <laughs> lobbyist throws some, you know, language at them, they, they say C++ and Python, they're like, wow, this, this person must be really smart. And so you end up with a lot more deference um, on the part of congressmen to lobbyists in this issue then you might, uh, with regard to lobbyists for, I don't know, agriculture or sure. defense manufacturing, almost anything else, not because they all know about it, but because it doesn't have a kind of mystique, especially for a lot of these older guys who are lawmakers. I don't know if that'll change as, you know, average age of, or, or, or as some of the older guys come out and younger people move in, but I think that's what's driven a lot of it up to now. I, I would like to give Congressman the computer operations portion of the PI Yeah, test yeah, there you go. Yeah, yeah, so yeah so give members of Congress <laughs> these three tests and see how they do. Uh, Jason, there's um, a lot of congressmen, not a lot, not enough, have talked about shifting away from family based to merit based. Um, have you seen any legislation that you like? Is, is Cotton's. Um, Reference to high skill, do you like that? Does he need to do more? Oh, I mean, there's no doubt that the Cotton Purdue bill, the RAISE Act, is a major step in the right direction. It, I mean, pr primarily actually because it reduces family reunification, which I, I think doesn't have the kind of benefits to America the other kinds of immigration might. But, uh, you know, on a point system, which is what it establishes, I'm a little more hesitant. I, I think it's it's the right idea in principle, but how it's executed obviously it makes a big uh, difference in whether it's successful or not. I think that the thresholds they put there were maybe a little low still, but nevertheless, I like the idea of having the test. There's an English language test, and you know when when you hear politicians say, you know, in order to get this amnesty or get this program, you just have to learn English and do that, and and, and you look at the fine print, it just says to learn English means you sign up for a course at one point, and no one even checks to see if you attended. <laughs> The idea of actually having an English test, we have a score and that converts to something that is meaningful in policy, is at least getting the conversation going in the right direction. Uh, yes, in the back. Thank you. Uh, for four years, I worked for a major academic equivalency firm in New York City uh, that actually uh, looked at these degrees. And um, I can tell you that most of the grades I saw were well below C's. And furthermore, I can tell you that the so-called professors who write the, uh, write the essays uh, do not see what they write. Uh, most, for the most part, it's 22-year-olds who... Uh, who do the grading, you mean? Like uh, they, TAs? Well, no, not even TAs. These are undergrads who have oh. no experience in the field who write um, basically form letters, which then professors authorize their signature for without seeing, for the most part. They just, um, they're on staff. They get paid a couple thousand a month to sign things that they often never review. Uh, and I think if people knew how these degrees were being evaluated, they would also have a lot of questions. Can, can you tell me just a little more about what, what you meant by academic equivalency? Yeah, absolutely. So um, when a candidate submits an H-1B or indeed an O application, um, they need to provide proof of their academic equivalency. So they'll go to a middleman, like the company I worked for, which I won't name. Um, they're a little litigious. Uh, <laughs> And um, that company will uh, equivalent the degree. Um, by oh, I see. In other words, it. like the, a foreign country will have a different name for the degree. Right. That kind exactly. of thing. I see. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Um, and the way that these degrees are being evaluated um, by these middlemen uh, is is typically without any standards uh, because it's it's a profit based industry and and the profit is is quite large. Um, so. USCIS, for the most part, isn't even looking at the um, base evidence. They're, they're getting information from profit-based middlemen, um, and it's to the advantage of these profit-based middlemen to push through people who 
truly are not qualified. And standards for O have also fallen dramatically. People are starting to push through people who should be H-1Bs through O because oh. they're not looked at as much as they ought to be. And that's the oh, visa wow. that's supposed to be for extraordinary oh, yes. ability. Right. Yeah. I was, yes, I was yeah. speaking to a lawyer, an immigration lawyer, who in fact told me O's are now for everyone. <laughs> Jeez, <laughs> unbelievable. Um, if you had a... I, I actually, actually have a question for mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. So, I don't know. Can you pick a country, and so how would you equivalent or whatever the, the <laughs> verb is, uh, you know, a bachelor's degree in math? Sure, definitely. Yeah. I mean, it, it would be a bachelor's degree in mathematics in America, and, you know, they, they might have, you know, Ds, Fs. It's not even brought up. The GPA is never mentioned. Um, often coursework isn't even mentioned. They used to mention coursework four years ago, but uh, standards have fallen. So now, so now <laughs> coursework's not even mentioned, and it's all templated. Um, so for the most part, the data is not even accurate. And then professors will sign off on it without reviewing anything themselves. They're just on payroll. Wow. Interesting. And that's industry standard. This should be on Tucker Carlson. Yeah, Tucker there Carlson. You go, yeah. <laughs> well, uh, well, the um, I actually had another question, uh, I guess, for either one of you, maybe Michelle first. The, a lot of the talk about moving away from family-based, you know, limiting family to really nuclear family, mm -hmm. there's two ways you can do, two things you can do with that. One, what the RAISE Act does is just get rid of those categories and then change the way we picked the existing number of skilled immigrants. In other words, keeps the employment-based numbers the same, just picks them differently and reduces the family so it's just the nuclear mm -hmm. family. Mm -hmm. The approach that a lot of the, there's a lot, of, a very widespread among Republicans, is to acknowledge the chain migration issue as a problem, but say all of those visas that were reduced should all go over to skilled immigration, to increase the, in other words, to keep immigration the same, but just shift it. And so it seems to me that's, that's an important part of the debate and a way that the lobbyists for especially the tech companies are trying to co-opt this concern f about chain migration by using it to their advantage. Yeah, bad. Yeah. <laughs> bad, as if we had, had, haven't had enough of those bad uh, deals and compromises going back to 1986 and, you know, right. amnesty now, enforcement later, and, yeah. I think there there are a variety of reasons to be concerned about that kind of proposal. Some of them not even economic, maybe cultural, about just having too many immigrants in general. Uh, but what I would say is, if you really do want, if you're convinced that it's best to have that many high skill immigrants, first what you need to do is figure out how to get high skill immigrants because we haven't right. figured that part out yet. <laughs> right, right. Very good. So actually, on that note, unless there's other. Uh, questions, we can wrap it up. Thanks, everybody, coming. I think um, uh, Jason and I are at least willing to be accosted afterwards. I don't want to speak for Michelle. <laughs> she may have to get somewhere. Thank you to everybody on uh, Facebook who's been watching this. And uh, we have uh, some uh, noshable materials over in the section over here to the right. The people on Facebook cannot enjoy that. So if you would come in person, you would have been able to get something to eat. So thank you, everybody, and hope to see you next time.